Greetings. Uh, I welcome you uh, to our program, uh, Diplomatic Corner. Uh, today, we are in the Indian Embassy premises. Uh, we, have, uh, we have with us a very distinguished diplomat. Uh, we have with us the Indian Ambassador, extraordinary and plenipotentiary, His Excellency uh, Ambassador Shire Robert Kintong. And uh, it's a delight and a pleasure to have, uh, uh, to have you in our program, sir. Welcome to our program. Uh, Professor Brooks, I would like to welcome you and all your team to the Indian Embassy. Thank you. Thank you. If I could say a, a few words on a, such a distinguished senior diplomat and statesman of uh, India. Uh, he has been an ambassador not only in Ethiopia. In Ethiopia, he has been an ambassador since August 2020, I believe. He has also been a, uh, an ambassador to Israel, to Italy, to Slovenia, and to Tanzania as well. And uh, also, he has served as undersecretary, deputy secretary, in the Distinguished Indian External Relations Ministry. Your Excellency, could you please tell, uh, tell us about your diplomatic career, your profession, and uh, now, of course, since 2020, your stay in Ethiopia? Uh, uh, I joined the uh, Indian Foreign Service in 2001. Uh, since then, I have served, as you had mentioned, Professor Brooks, I have served in Israel, uh, Italy, then went back to India. After that, I went to Slovenia, and then, I was India's Deputy High Commissioner in Tanzania for three and a half years. Then I, was, uh, then I, I went back to India, having served in our foreign ministry for two years. Uh, I have been appointed as India's uh, ambassador to Ethiopia and permanent representative to the African Union. So I've been here since October 2020. Wonderful. I feel you'll feel uh, at home. Uh, and, and by the way, uh, for, uh, for our uh, yeah, audience, for the record, His Excellency the Ambassador is also the permanent delegate of the Republic of India to the African Union, yes. I would say. As uh, I had again mentioned, uh, my, uh, my children, I have a young, uh, two young children. They grew up in um, Tanzania and now we have come back to uh, Ethiopia, so East Africa is li like our second home. Wonderful. Welcome, welcome back to Africa. And I bet they speak um, a bit of Swahili or even more Swahili, your, your, your children, besides English and, you know. Yeah, we know a little bit of Swahili, yes, Professor, yes. Wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you. Wonderful. You know, uh, as you know, Your Excellency, you know, India uh, and Ethiopian relations go back uh, thousands of years. Both, both people's cultures and civilizations are thousands, thousands of years old. Uh, only the Indian subcontinent, the Indian Ocean, separates us from the Horn of Africa there. There are so many evidences that testify to the fact that there were really intense commerce, trade uh, between uh, the, the states of Ethiopia, even at the time of Aksum. The coins are found in India, as well as the Indian, you know, the, the, the Indian state. Uh, as such. So it goes, goes a long, long way. And, uh, uh, and for us uh, Ethiopians also, we feel uh, we follow with interest the independence of India and uh, etc. Uh, let's first start off with the bilateral relations between the two countries. If you could just uh, update us on what are the features of this bilateral relations. I think uh, people uh, are very right when they say that Ethiopia is the land of origin. Uh, we in India also say that India is an ancient civilization. So that actually indicates that we have been in touch for the last two, three thousand years. And it was trade that brought the people of these two countries together. Uh, you, would, you would recall that about 400, 500 years ago, actually there were Ethiopians who had gone to India. Uh, they, they had gone as soldiers. And over the years, some of them managed to rise up and actually become local chiefs. So we have uh, uh, buildings or forts uh, constructed by Ethiopian generals in Gujarat and even in West Bengal. So then about 150 years ago, we had about uh, 150 uh, Indian families, mainly in Dere Dawa and then in Addis Ababa, who have made uh, Ethiopia their home. Uh, many of them have gone back or have left Ethiopia for other countries, but today about 60 families from mainly from Gujarat have lived here, have made Ethiopia their home for the last four or five generations. 
If you would recall, during the uh, imperial times, we had thousands, tens of thousands of Indian teachers, mostly from the Indian state of Kerala, who came here, who, who taught in secondary schools. And many of them uh, taught uh, even in the remote areas of Ethiopia. These teachers, all of them, or many of them, most of them have left. Some of them are still here. They have made Ethiopia their home. Indian professors and lecturers have joined them recently. So we have a substantial presence of Indian faculty in public universities in Ethiopia. In this, I think the most visible uh, aspect of our bilateral relations is the business. Because in the last 15, 20 years, a number of business investors from India have made Ethiopia their home. So today, we have um, about 650 Indian companies who have uh, been registered with the Ethiopian uh, Investment Commission. Mm -hmm. And we estimate that these Indian factories employ, give employment to about 72,000 Ethiopian nationals. So actually, it's a very substantial uh, presence. Uh, in terms of bilateral trade, we are one of the top uh, uh, trading partners for Ethiopia. Last year, uh, our bilateral basket, trade basket stood at about 1.2, 1.3 billion dollars. So actually, even in terms of business, in terms of trade, our, uh, our relations are excellent. But that only gives us this hope that there is opportunity to expand our, uh, our relations in terms of business and trade. Very true. Uh, very true, really. Uh, mm -hmm. I appreciate uh, your, your, uh, your, your analysis. It is true. Uh, you have covered the education. Yes, you know, um, I remember as well, growing up in Ethiopia, we, uh, so many Ethiopian uh, students, uh, they were educated uh, by, by Indian nationals as teachers in uh, high school, middle school and the like, especially in public schools. And this, these are Indian presence in Ethiopia in terms of education. Every year, the Indian government or foreign ministry provides 55 scholarships. These are undergraduate, postgraduate, or PhD. Besides that, every year we used to conduct 400 uh, uh, training programs, short-term training programs for Ethiopian nationals. Yes, during the last two years, because of the COVID pandemic, we have suspended uh, the physical training programs. But uh, now that uh, now that situation has improved, we believe we will, we will resume training programs in India. So this is again training program. In addition, uh, the Indian Ministry of Education also provides scholarships. Also the private, the, 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 the Indian universities on their own also provide scholarships. More than that, we have a number of Ethiopian students who are self-financing. So we estimate that Ethiopian students form one of the largest groups from Africa, Africa. who are studying in India. So actually, education is Wonderful. a very important aspect of our uh, relations. You have, uh, you have, you have uh, gone ahead of me and <laughs> answered my questions, which I really appreciate. Because uh, you know, I was about to say, you know, uh, India uh, is well known for its uh, quality and standard of education. And uh, we appreciate the help uh, scholarship that Ethiopian young generation get, it means a lot. It's changing life, it's shaping the minds of human beings, the young generation, getting the right degree and stuff and coming back and serving the nation. On top of that, if I may, Your Excellency, uh, India has an affordable educational university system and that has allowed now the growing, shall I say, lower middle class, upper middle class Ethiopian community or group of people to go there and get a high quality education. What I also want to mention is that because we have been uh, in contact for the last thousands of years, mm -hmm. so uh, we have similarities. For example, uh, there is a similarity in rock engineering. When I say rock engineering, you have those famous rock-hewn churches of Lalibela. In terms of engineering, we find them similar to the South Indian single rock uh, temple engineering. That is. So we believe that it was straight that brought ideas together, you know. Your injera, our dosa are similar. Culture is similar. 
Ethiopia has a very diverse culture. India has very diverse culture. You also, because of the diversity, you, uh, you are able to accept people. Indian people have the same hospitality. They accept Ethiopians like their sisters and brothers. So that is why when Ethiopian students go to India, they are already familiar with the society that, uh, that uh, they are. So, so, so it is very easy to mingle and be accepted. I travel around this country to various regions and I was really pleasantly surprised to meet people who can speak Hindi. So when I ask them, they say that, some of them say that uh, because by watching Hindi movies, uh, oh, yeah. uh -huh, yeah. they are they're able very, to speak very Hindi. Popular in Ethiopia. Very I also met one student, or not a student, one gentleman. He was very, uh, he was speaking Hindi very fluently. I asked him the reason. He said that 15 years ago when he was studying in Symbiosis University in Pune, mm -hmm. there were 2,500 Ethiopian students in Pune alone. So that is the kind of uh, yeah. the contact we exactly. have in terms of education. Exactly. And in terms of education, we have, um, uh, so Ethiopia has to grow. We have a vision and uh, a mission, you know, to make Ethiopia prosperous. Uh, and uh, space science, you know, engineering, I mean, India is right there, you know, it's one of the top countries in the world with space engineering, aeronautics and everything. So we have a lot of uh, knowledge transfer that we need from, uh, from India. We need more and more professors to come here, lecture, uh, staff exchange, faculty exchange, that I hope and I'm sure will be worked out under your good guidance as ambassador of India to Ethiopia. In, in the last one year, the embassy of India in Addis Ababa has actually reached out to about 25 public universities in Ethiopia. We have visited Metu University, we have visited Gambela, we have visited Zigziga, Arba Mins. You know, we have reached 25 universities and still we are reaching out. That is because we want universities in Ethiopia to collaborate with centers of higher learning in India because education uh, empowers people. It, it will bring it's the key. Yes. yes. Thank you. Thank you. You have uh, emphasized that. Uh, that, uh, that, is, that is great. Rightfully, you know, focused on trade, commerce, and investment in Ethiopia uh, by Indian investors, entrepreneurs. And of course, uh, I would like to connect this with uh, the efforts of India. And that is in regard to, uh, you know, strengthening, bolstering uh, trade, commerce, uh, entrepreneurship, investment between India, this big nation of 1.2 billion people with the 54 uh, African uh, sovereign nations. In that regard, India had started this um, India-Africa uh, uh, Forum Summit. The, fir the first one was held in 2008 in New Delhi, and then the second one was held in 2011, every three years. In I where else? In Addis, I think, <laughs> which makes us happy, of course. But while Ethiopia was chosen to be the host of that at the center. And the third was held in 2015, once again in, in New Delhi, in, in, in a rotation. Could you, please, um, in, 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 uh, could you please say a few words on the mission, the goal, uh, the purpose of this uh, uh, Indo-African Summit Forum? Thank you. Professor, when the uh, leaders from Africa and India met in New Delhi for the third Africa Forum Summit, the leaders in one voice declared, they stated, we are partners in progress. We are partners. Our relations are based on equality, solidarity, friendship. We are partners. So that is why India has always uh, assisted our sisters and brothers in improving their capacities. So we are providing so many scholarships mm -hmm. so that students from Africa can benefit from Indian institutions in India. They have identified many areas. Some of the areas are, are like capacity building, health, you know, economy, trade. So these are the leaders have identified seven or eight areas saying that this is where India and Africa should be partners. So we are looking at the Ford India Africa Forum Summit and we will continue to push with agendas that all, all of us agree and identify that this is beneficial to all of us. So but as I said, yes. we are partners in progress. Very good. 
And uh, that's, uh, I think, a good uh, strategy, I, I believe, and a good roadmap of collaboration. We live in a global, globalized world. Africa is India, India is Africa, I think. Uh, there's a whole lot of, uh, you know, uh, economic already interactions between countries of Africa and India. India is the largest software developer, you know, to, you know and also so many things. And uh, I believe it's a win-win situation you know, on both sides of the Indian continent. Uh, I see. So when shall we expect to see the fourth uh, Indian-African uh, forum uh, summit? We, uh, we are at the present. At present, we are in talks. Uh, we we are looking at maybe this year or maybe early next year or after that. So we are looking at, but talks Very are good. happening. Very good. Discussions are happening. Very good. And the strategy, by the way, Your Excellency, I like the strategy. I believe the first and second summit was started with 14 key African states. And then more were added, and I, I believe by the third one, I mean, all 54 were invited. Uh, so that also uh, is a strategy of opening up spaces for each and every uh, an African country. Because for us, every partner is important. Every African country is our brother, our sister. They are very important. Now, let's say, let's move to uh, the for, uh, foreign policy, of course. Uh, uh, and uh, let's start with the cornerstones of uh, Indian foreign policy first. I think like generally speaking, the foreign policy of a country is to safeguard its uh, national security, its identity, its interests. So naturally, India's foreign policy is based basically on this fundamental idea that it is for our national interest. Foreign policy also should be complementary to a country's economic development. It's very important. Professor, people say that we can choose friends, but we cannot choose our neighbors. Absolutely. So that is why for us, our neighborhood is very important. We want every country in the neighborhood to, uh, to progress, what we call a Sagar policy. It is security and, you know, uh, this in, uh, it's about a security parameters and development for all countries in our neighborhood. So that is why South Asia, Southeast Asia is very key, plus the Indian Ocean. In addition, us, we are living in a, in, in a global uh, world. We also believe that the UN Security Council mm -hmm. should re reflect the geopolitical reality. So it is, it is, uh, it is our right, it is India's right, it is Africa's right to say that we should be presented in the UN Security Council. That was my, my other yes. question. Yes, yes. So because uh, you, we, uh, we represent one-seventh of the population, you also, uh, Africa also represents one-seventh one, one, one of the global population. So our voice should be heard and the the, the UN security uh, arrangements should uh, should be uh, should be uh, should represent all of us if it has to be legitimate if it has to be effective. Wonderful, definitely. Uh, we will go back to a very quite interesting topic. And that's uh, uh, India's principle of uh, pan chishel. You know, it's very quite interesting. That's I believe the cornerstone of uh, cornerstone of Indian foreign policy. You know, uh, international peace and security, promoting it. Uh, maintaining uh, honorable and just relations between nations of the world, rich or poor, developing or developed, uh, fostering respect for international law. India is right there since uh, uh, the beginning of the United Nations as well. Encouraging you know, uh, settlement of disputes by arbitration and peaceful. Uh, and also the policy of non-alignment, which will come to that, if you would care to say about that. And the policy of anti-colonialism and anti-racism, the role that India played I believe in 1964 at the United Nations, India was the first country to, to present a resolution in regard to uh, racism and apartheid as well. So if you could just, uh, just enlighten us on that. Uh, on 9th May 1936, when foreign power or foreign armies were in Addis Ababa, India was then under colonial rule. Even during that time, people of India actually organize mass demonstrations to show their solidarity for the people of Ethiopia. So even when we were fighting for our independence, we were already showing our solidarity to the people in Africa. So once 
we got our independence. I think India has always taken this um, uh, mission on itself that we will stand for people in the South. So that is why uh, uh, we have been very active as a matter of principle. We have always stood for independence of countries in Asia and Africa. So, so pro Professor, you would, uh, you would know that even at the UN, India has been very active, has always taken, um, uh, has always spoken for, uh, the, has, has been always the voice for the people uh, in, uh, in Africa and in Asia. So. Very, very true, very true. That is all in, in the beginning, you know. Uh, in, the, in, in the South Africa, for instance, you know, played a major role uh, by, by India in galvanizing support regarding apartheid, to fight apartheid. And that the agenda, the issue becomes an agenda in the United Nations General Assembly and, and, and others. And or also, please keep this in mind that the leader, Mahatma Gandhi, the leader of our, uh, of, uh, of our struggle, actually got his inspirations from Africa. So, so. In his state, South Africa. That was also my other question about none other than the soul and the conscience of India. You know, the great you know, Mahatma Gandhi, and who had lived in uh, South Africa for 22 years, as you say. And still that relationship continues. What has happened 60, 70 years ago still continues. The Indian Prime Minister has always been a voice for the people in, from Africa and Asia. So that relationship, that yeah, very solidarity true. continues. Yeah, absolutely. And that, this will take me to India's, India's role in terms of uh, peacekeeping uh, and um, uh, its activity or engagement in peacekeeping missions in the United Nations. More than 100,000, I believe, Indian Blue Helmet troops served across, across the world. I think, um, I think uh, Ethiopian, uh, Ethiopia and India are one of the largest contributors of peacekeepers in terms of numbers. Also, please uh, let us keep this in mind that lots of our soldiers mm -hmm. have given up their precious lives, you know, for international peace. So it is not only India, it is Ethiopia also and India also that we have really contribute, contributed uh, towards a uh, global peace. So. Absolutely, absolutely. Ethiopia is number one actually in Africa, as, as, as late as, I think, lately as one or two years ago. You know, statistics might change here and there, of course, but Ethiopia is always the top three, number one as well. That shows the commitment of Ethiopia yes. to maintenance of peace and stability in the world, in the African continent as well. Uh, and uh, this will take us to India here again, the principles, you know, uh, India has, and has its own way, shall, shall we say. Always, especially at the end of the Second World War, there were two literally big camps, the free world or the West European world led by America, and then the, the former USSR in China and the other group. And India, you know, Nehru, another great son and statesman of uh, India, a great, a great personality, a great mind. Uh, you know, under his tutelage or under his leadership also, India was involved later on in the non-aligned movement. And Tito and him and others in the Indonesia Bandung Conference 1955 and others. Uh, so India had played a significant role in the non-aligned movement. Would it be correct if we say that India is uh, always sort of, you know, carving out or trying its own alternative way, contra to the other two, bipolar world, I if think, you could comment on that. I think what India is conveying is that as a sovereign country, you can decide your own destiny. I think uh, whether it be non-alignment or whether it be any other policy that India pursues is always based on sovereignty of our country and our independence. We should on our own decide our destiny. Very true. And, and we have always led this, uh, uh, led uh, the countries, especially from, uh, you know, from the south, from the developing south, that we should be in a position to have our own independent foreign policies, and we will also respect that. Yeah. And also work with others yes. who have similar views, and hence non-aligned movement, G77, India playing a prominent role always.
Anyways, great. Now shall we come to one individual, prominent individual now, uh, the great Mahatma Gandhi, 20, 22 years you know, in Africa, of course, from 1893 to 1915. He practiced law, he lived there, he saw uh, social problems, he saw injustices happening, taking place. He was committed to social justice, and then he came back to India in 1915, and of course, the rest is history. He became, uh, you know, the conscience of India here again, plus he, he was the, at the forefront of uh, fighting for justice, emancipation, and independence of India. And he led India to independence in August 1947, of course. Uh, can, can you say something about his life? I think for me, uh uh, what I only, what a sentence that he had, of course, he's, he has lots of, uh, lots of, uh, he, uh, you know, uh, he has taught us many things, but there is one line that I, al that I always remember about him. He says that, not in the same way, but just to paraphrase, or he says that the success of a country or the success of a nation is to wipe wiped out the tear of the common man. I think what he, what he meant was that, you know, we should not uh, differentiate between people. The poorest man should have the same opportunity, should be given the same opportunity so that, so that he can improve his life and as a country, we should minimize his burden or his suffering. So wiping out the tear of every person, I think, is the goal of every, every country. So your, your Excellency, you know, talking about uh, Mahatma Gandhi, a great uh, soul and conscience of uh, India, and those who seek uh, justice, social justice in the world, actually, humanity, I would say. He lived for humanity, not only India. He's a gift to all, the, to all you know, people who seek justice. Uh, he is... Uh, a number of uh, political movements and uh, statesmen have followed his example in, in the fight for emancipation and for struggle for independence. And one of them is, of course, Nelson Mandela, the principle of peaceful, uh, you know, uh, uh, struggle. Uh, another is even Martin Luther King in America, among African Americans. Uh, for that, uh, he's well known of. If you could share with us, you know, s your ideas about the life and the philosophy in a very brief way, I know one could talk for. You know, books and write books about it, about uh, Mahatma Gandhi. I think uh, Mahatma Gandhi affects the life of everyone in every way. Uh, for example, let us say uh, he, has, he was already talking about unity in diversity. He knows that India as a civilization is a very diverse country like Ethiopia. All, religion, all religions have their presence in India. Every, every 50, 60 kilometers that you travel in India, there are different people who speak different dialects, who have different food habits. We have about 20 official languages. We have 1,000 dialects. All religions have presence. So he was already talking about unity in diversity then. He was already telling the Indian people that we should coexist happily, we should live in harmony. Uh, in the immediate past, the Prime Minister of India has, uh, has undertaken this initiative of Clean India, an inspiration from Gandhi's teachings and life. So today, Swatch Bharat is a mission where cleanliness will have to start from, from oneself. So what, what happens is that for me, if cleanliness is, is very important, I should start with cleaning my own office. So today we have, we, uh, the, the Prime Minister of India is leading this campaign. He, it has been an inspiration to all of us to be clean, to be hygienic. So, so uh, you know, um, it, would take, it would take me a whole day to narrate uh, many things or many incidents about Mr. Uh, Mahatma Gandhi's life or his teachings, but I think with these two short, uh, the thing that I have mentioned, I think that should suffice the yes, listeners. Yes, yes. Your, your thank, your you. listeners no, no, yeah. thank you, thank you for, for enlightening us about that, really. And also the debate goes on, you know, uh, some are a bit critical of uh, his position because they say that 
only by peace and no change for the thing would come. That is the, the radical aspect. So in, it's a, it's a science of politics, polemics about that, but uh, he has his own uh, well, well printed, you know, his, his theory, his logic, his approach has been accepted by so many in, in, in the world. There was, that is why for India, Mahatma Gandhi is father of our nations. Yes, absolutely, absolutely, a father of a nation. And by the way, he paid with his life for preaching peace, harmony among people. And of course, as always, extremists, you know, they use this, exploit this opportunity to, you know, to take away his life, but his idea and his legacy lives on. And he's known for that as the father of so many millions, not only Indians, so many millions who, who accept peace, harmony, uh, etc. you know, in the world. Now, uh, Your Excellency, let's move to, uh, of course, India, this mystic giant country, 1.2 billion people, you know, the top five, you know, economy in the world. The GDP is increasing, a uh, country of so diverse in people's in cultures, as you have spoken. And also, it's a nuclear power. You know, it didn't take India 10 years, I believe, it's, uh, it's from 64 to 74 to become a nuclear power. Uh, uh, what would, would you say to people who say that uh, those countries who have nuclear powers should, should, be, should be very careful, you know, uh, to, 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 they should take care of it? because it will be devastating in either way, this way or that way, when it is applied in times of crisis and political you know, conflicts and the like. Uh, and India is also, the discussion is there in Indian academics as well, uh, Indian universities and research books and the like, you know, as to how India should utilize it and under what stress and under what duration. If you could uh, care to say something on that. Uh, what I only what I would like to emphasize is that for us being a nuclear power is only for our security it's only for nuclear deterrence and India has categorically categorically, categorically stated that we will not use so uh, we will not use uh, nuclear uh, against and we, uh, no first use right we will not use against non no, no first power. strike policy. And all the countries in the world, including nuclear powers, already appreciate the kind of system we have put in place because India is a responsible country. I think there is no doubt about this. And India is committed to peace, world peace, and regional peace as well. Yes. Yeah. Very well. And when you talk about uh, nuclear powers, it's all based on nuclear technology, and uh, there are so many ways of using nuclear technology for peaceful purposes, purposes you know, and for, med for med 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 medication, for so many wonderful things, you know, for energy as a source for energy and things like that. And uh, that, I think, would is the right approach, and I think it would suffice to just stop there and respect, of course, India as a nuclear power. It belongs to the nuclear power of nations, which are just a few besides the top five countries, and then there are four or five you know, uh, countries uh, uh, that developed it after India. Uh, so now let's move to, uh, we talked about the Indian nuclear policy. Now let's move to uh, the uh, Indian uh, uh, activity in the United Nations. I think uh, 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 at present, India, uh, we are, we are um, we are a member of the Security Council at the moment. And I think in, in the discussions that uh, India has taken lead, I think what we have sh shown is that India can contribute to, uh, to the global peace order. We, uh, we want uh, the UN system to, to, be, uh, to be representative. Uh, we want it to be effective. We want it to address issues concerning humanity. So I think in all discussions that India has participated, or even uh, discussions that India has initiated, we have always shown that India stands for uh, the countries in the South, and that, once again, uh, that it is our right to be a member of uh, the UN Security Council. So, so, so. Wonderful, wonderful. And that will bring us to, uh uh, restructuring or the idea in the discourse and the debate of restructuring the Security Council. When the UN was uh, founded, it was founded on a certain political reality 
where there was a certain political config, global configuration. Right. Now people are saying that already 75 years, getting close to 80 years, uh, that uh, needs to also reflect the current political structure and the international political hierarchy. So there are serious discussions in academia, uh, as well as in and around the UN, uh, a good exercise, I would say, as to how to go about it. Uh, five permanent members, ten non-permanent members. Uh, people say there are giant nations like India, uh, Brazil should be there, it's suggested Germany from Europe should be there, Japan from Asia should be there. And from Africa, Nigeria as the largest uh, population, not only that, but the economy. Uh, so there are these key countries, it is felt, should be represented, should we should open up the, the permanent seats of five and make it into a seat of 10. And there are, by the way, two or three variations of how to go about it. If you could comment on that, Your Excellency. Since the formation of the UN 75 years ago, more than 100 countries have gained independence. Yep. So today's UN structure should, should reflect the geopolitical situation of today and Everyone has agreed that the UN system should, uh, should be changed or should, or should reflect uh, the reality and that uh, countries like India or countries in Africa should be represented. Uh, I think it is only a matter of time that all the countries will come to an agreement whether so many countries uh, should, should be in the UNSC or how many countries in Africa or, you know, how many countries from the Caribbean should be part of that structure. Sure. But, 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 at, but it will come soon. Uh, it will come soon because everyone today uh, accepts that the UNSC or the United Nations system should, uh, should be reflective of the geopolitical situation of today. Very good. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, we live in a globalized world. It is human nature that people move from one, one part of the world to the other, from one country into the other, in search of jobs, in search of economic uh, you know, opportunities, uh, in search of education, uh, in search of uh, safety, physical safety, political freedom, because of uh, political persecution. So there is this interaction that is never ending. It's human nature. Uh, humans move from one part of the country, from Gujarat to Uttar Pradesh, or to Kerala, it's natural. Uh, and from Ethiopia, from here to Bahardar, from Bahardar to, uh, to Adama and uh, Awasa, it's natural, for so many different reasons. Now, given that, uh, I'm amazed uh, by uh, the magnitude, the scale, and the activity of the Indian diaspora. Quite an example. Uh, as far as I have fact-checked, there are about 32 million Indians in the world. And this diaspora, even in America, we have two million plus. Kamala Harris comes into mind. Mm -hmm. The first vice president of Indian and Jamaican descent. She's her dad, rather her, her mom is a scientist, her late mom. She came from India. Uh, there are a, a number of senators and congressmen in America, for example, of Indian origin. Uh, there are universities, even elite universities, where Indians are at the head of the corporate world even, the academia, corporate world. Wherever you go, Indians are, the scientists, engineers. So many thousands of engineers are in America, in key places. Okay. So my question is, uh, they did not just cut the umbilical cord with Mother India, but they do what? They make remittances. And uh, the, the last uh, I have is about $98 billion annually, at a minimum. All dollars are flowed back from this diaspora into India. And if you could comment on their contributions to that, sir. I, I had mentioned about uh, lots of similarities between Ethiopia and India. I think the other similarity is our diaspora. Even the Ethiopian diaspora is big, of course, since India is a lar larger country, so we have a, a larger number of uh, people who live abroad. But what I want to say is that India and Ethiopia, as two countries, we know uh, the value of our diaspora. So I think both the countries are actively reaching out uh, to the diaspora community abroad. And the other thing is that 
the Ethiopian diaspora or the Indian diaspora have never forgotten the motherland. Very true. Very true. So you will see that they are immensely proud of the countries they live in, but they also don't forget their origins, that is Ethiopia and India. So that is why, uh, without uh, really elaborating, what I only want to say is that the diaspora of our two countries have been blessings. Yes, and I just couldn't agree more, Your Excellency. You remind me of the Ethiopian diaspora, you know, uh, in the Middle East, around this area, in America, in Europe, especially we are highly placed in, in the USA because of historical reasons, number-wise. Uh, conservatives estimate 500, from 500,000 to a million. It's just a drop. India, because of its huge size, several million Indians are, as already shared with you, are in America and in other countries. And just two weeks ago, uh, the agency looking after diaspora matters in Ethiopia. The Ethiopia diaspora agency? Actually, they had gone to India. They have interacted with uh, various ministries and departments in India to exchange ideas. And also, uh, I, I, was, I, was, I wanted to share with you, and uh, if you would like to comment on it, uh, the diaspora are not just there, let's say, in America and Europe. They remit money, as well as, as long as they are there in America, they are Indo-Americans or, or Americans of Indian descent. They never forget India, because I was also a diaspora living in America for quite a while. And I see their activity. They are very strong. They are well organized. They also uh, try to make an impact in a positive way in the American political system. And that's amazing. And uh, Ethiopians uh, and other minorities, they look up to the Indian community. I just want to share that with you. Oh, you. They have polit political action committees in the in American Congress. And for the first time, in, uh, as Ethiopians, we started uh, our first uh, political action committees in and around Congress, believe it or not. And that's uh, APAC, the, uh, the American Ethiopian Political Action Committee. We, just, we are just starters, but we look at Indians, Filipinos, we look at Pakistanis and others as well as, as examples. And uh, uh, Indians uh, and Ethiopians, we eat each other's, we visit each other's restaurant wherever we are. And you have eloquently uh, showed uh, the culture, the food, the, 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 the psychic, I would say, of being an Indian and an Ethiopian is very, very similar. And actually, the diaspora community is the actual ambassador representing India or Ethiopia. But also keep this in mind that in East Africa, we have a huge uh, Indian diaspora. So we have very strong presence of Indian origin people in Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania. I told you earlier that 60 families have made their home in Ethiopia. We also have a huge presence in South Africa. And this Indian diaspora actually are the ambassadors bridging, bridging their countries with India. So. Very true. Mauritius in South Africa. I had the opportunity to, be, to visit uh, for a conference, UN conference in Port Elizabeth, Durban, I think, I believe, area. You find lots of South African Indians, and they are well placed also in the South African political, economic, and social system. And, and uh, that's their home, but they are, still have a time. Mauritius, Seychelles to a lesser extent. Oh, Kenya, by the way, here, uh, our neighbor to the south, Republic of Kenya, you find thousands of uh, Kenyans of Indian origin, and they play a wonderful role, and Tanzania as well. Yes, yes. So yes, uh, I agree. India is uh, at the age of 75 now. No, formally, so to speak, since uh, August uh, 1947. And the 75th anniversary, I think, uh, is, uh, will culminate in August. Uh, it is being celebrated. India is the largest democracy in the world. Uh, if one wants to see a political system working, one should really closely look at the political system of India. A parliamentary system with a weak presidential system, uh, a responsible judiciary, independent. Uh, the executive is with, it has teeth. Uh, now uh, the 14th prime minister is uh, none other than Modi, a very famous person of the BJP, of course. Uh, and uh, the transfer of power with a handshake is really what people want to see in so many African countries, in so many developing countries. Uh, and uh, when we teach at the universities, when we discuss among us Ethiopians, as Americans, we say, look at India. Uh, they are fighting their, their poverty uh, with economic measures and the like, but still, politically, they are the largest democracy. If you could care on uh, the, the pride of India, that's the system itself. I don't want to dwell much on in internal matters, 
because you are a decorated diplomat. I will not go deeper into that, but just the general aspect, if you could share see, with India, us something. See, India is the largest democracy, but Professor, what I only want to say is that, actually, for, let me just come to India, Ethiopia. Actually, both the countries can learn from each other. You know, uh, there are certain things that India, that Ethiopia can learn from India. The same way we can also learn from uh, Ethiopia. In the same way, and on a larger perspective, India can learn from Africa. Africa can also learn from India. Very true. And uh, India got its independence in 1947, so we are celebrating our 75 years. Our prime minister decided that we should celebrate for 75 weeks. So actually, our celebrations have started last year. Yeah. It will end in August 2023, so 75 weeks. Also, uh, Ethiopia was one of the first countries from Africa to establish diplomatic relations with India in 1948. So we are going to celebrate 75 years of diplomatic relations between India and Ethiopia next year. So we at the embassy, what we have decided is that we are